All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering two questions from the Patreons. Lots of gems, lots of duck button, lots of my uncle taught Bruce Lee, the Taekwondo don't, so many kicks. Let's get to it. And every day, I practice martial arts. Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? Sifu, I'm doing great today. Uh, uh, so I just heard Mikey <laughs> call you the Dre FG. So I think that... I didn't that, even hear that. That's you didn't hear it? Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. All right. The Dre uh, FG? So I think you should, for now and be ever, for now and ever, be known as the Dre FG. Dre Fu Genius? No, just Dre FG. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> What? Anyway, like it's cool Dre to see Fu. you. So here we are have in you a ever new season. Dre Fu? No, I've not practiced Dre Fu, thankfully. <laughs> um, so here we are in a new season. I Super exciting. Dre Fu all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, what are you most excited about in the new season? H- having no knowledge of what Mikey and I have planned for the new the, season. The interviews. There's oh, so he has a listened a little bit. Wow, that's really incredible. Cool interviews coming up. Yes, absolutely. So I, we're going to be doing more interviews. Yeah. We're going to do more special episodes uh, and also chopping up a lot of these episodes into little clickbait Bobby topics. Bobby Samuels. Yeah, we'll finally get Bobby <laughs> Samuels on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who else will we will finally get Vincent Lynn on the podcast. Yeah. Finally get Matt Pauly. Michael uh, Jai White. S- no. What? Steve K- can't stand Michael Jai <laughs> White. All right. He the wants movies to are, be on the podcast. His movies what are, are awful. About? All right. Are you uh, serious? He wants to be on a podcast. And Black Dynamite is one of the best movies. Black Dynamite is great. I but love just Black like, Dynamite. But every time Michael Jai White is in an interview, he just puts his foot in his mouth uh, and then changes it like a month <laughs> later. All right. And I don't know. I just I just find him not as spectacular as he could I be. Think, He's done some good stuff. Spawn, uh, when okay. he played Tyson, Black Dynamite, awesome. But like... Why don't we do an episode of just... What you don't like about Michael Gucci? No, 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 no. That would, I, I, I don't have that much to actually say about him. I just don't think okay. like okay. I just don't I just don't find him that interesting. Uh, um, and he's like, ambivalent. He he's yes, ambivalent. yes, yes. Huh? So anyway, uh, so here we are for another episode. Uh, just to remind everyone that the best way to support the Kung Fu Genius is on Patreon. Patreon.com/slash the Kung Fu Genius. For as little as five dollars a month, you can get access to episodes early. All sorts of extra goodies, higher levels of support will give you things like even private episodes and all sorts of other stuff. And I usually put a few things on Patreon that uh, don't go elsewhere, plus my Instagram reels. So, yeah, check us out. Patreon.com slash The Kung Fu Genius. Let's uh, get those Patreons up so I can, um, I can start throwing some get, bones your guys' yeah. way. All right. So we are here. We are going to the answer best questions. Best support. Best port is support, just like the best nation <laughs> best is the donation. Nation. That's right, baby. Got it. Got it. So... Uh, as uh, we've discussed before, so direct questions we only take from our Patreon supporters. So if you have questions that you want me to answer on the podcast, uh, you got to be on Patreon. Uh, we will gladly take episode ideas from people in the YouTube comments. True, true. Uh, but no direct questions. I still get a lot of direct questions on there. Mm. And then I have to like put the link to Patreon like an asshole underneath. <laughs> uh, but, but it's like, uh, that's the way it is. Hey, so um, it is what it so is. anyway, we Don't have a couple questions from our Patreon supporters. So what you got for me, Drake? Are you an instructor from the WT Wing Chun line and are confused about aspects of your Wing Chun training? Do you have questions about application, Guo Sao, Lat Sao, or how to train or teach Chi Sao? Do you need help with your curriculum or just guidance to push past your current skill level? Please consider coming to Florida and doing an immersion course with me. Immersion courses are 20 private lessons taught in five days in a very serious and intensive manner. These are done in my Florida home so you can stay there and focus on your training in the sunshine. Courses are individually crafted to your needs after we have a consultation. No politics, no nonsense, just serious training. Click the link in the description of this episode to find out more about immersion training with me in Florida. I'm currently filling up spots for March and April of 2023, so apply today to get one of those dates. Spots are limited because of my schedule, so book before the end of February 2023. Again, the link for immersion training in Florida is in the description below, and I'll see you in the sunshine. I got the first one ready right here, and I'm going to read it. I like how he says this like he's done something. Ah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> he's done some work. Yeah. Well, he has to do a little bit. Well, look, look how he's holding his arm. Yeah, I know. It's, just, it's exhausting yeah, for him right problem. now. Yeah. All right, let's problem? go, Dre. No, this is 
how the doctor ordered it. Francisco Ortiz. All right. One of the old school Patreon. Yeah. 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 One of my old school training partners. How about that? Oh, I don't know if I trained with him technically, but we trained at the same school together. Uh, Greetings, KFG. Yo. I have always been curious about how Bruce Lee learned his high kicks and jump kicks. In the past, Chuck Norris claimed that he influenced Bruce Lee to start using high kicks. As we know, that is total BS. Since Bruce was already throwing high kicks before they ever met. Yep. Proof can be seen in his 1965 audition for Charlie Chan's number one son. Right. Okay. Jun Ri has also been mentioned as the one who have taught Bruce Lee high kicks. Mm -hmm. Okay. They supposedly met in 1964 at the Long Beach Karate Championships, which makes it more plausible. Right. Yes. Do you think Bruce Lee learned his high kicks, jump kicks from Rune, I mean, uh, Jun Ri? If not, who may have influenced his high kicking techniques? Finally, being that you are a black belt in Taekwondo, do you think Bruce Lee's kicks were influenced more by Korean kicking system compared to other systems of kicking? Thanks for taking the time to answer my question, Frank O. Awesome. That's a really great question. Yes. And this is like a perennial nugget that comes up every, you know, if you are anywhere on the, anywhere where you see people talking about Bruce Lee or usually arguing about Bruce Lee, everyone claiming that they are the ones that know everything about Bruce Lee to the, uh, um, to the absolute exception to anyone else outside of their little field. They're the only ones that know. Oh yeah. They're and the experts. So, so a couple, a couple things I have to say about this before I, and, Wait, and what's, when, I got yeah. I got to cut you off for a split second. I like Please. the hat you have on. Oh, yeah. you like this KFG I hat that I'm wearing? You, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm also, by the way, what's wearing going on a here? KFG What's going shirt. on here? All right. Let's see. All right. Uh, there. Uh. So yeah, we have, uh, thank you for, um, hey. help, helping me monetize the podcast <laughs> a little bit more. Because, uh, yeah, was, I'm, I'm, was, I'm all about the Bruce Lee stuff, and you're like, yo, the yeah. swag. No, right? but I was looking at your eyes, you know, focused, and then, you know, I looked up. I, I You know, people, some people, they, they look away, you know. During, right, right, right. Yes, yes. Yeah, during um, eye contact. Exactly. And exactly. I just look right up and happen to see the KFG on the on Yeah, the, so on the uh, for people who are watching us on YouTube, yeah. uh, or for those of you listening to us on audio, I apologize. Swag delicious. This is all useless. Yeah, um, yeah I'm wearing a KFG beanie yeah. uh, with the old KFG logo. So we, we basically have uh, two logos. Mm-hmm. We have, this is the original one, which was, which may have been influenced by Shaw brothers. May have. Uh, yeah. I mean, okay. I can neither confirm I, nor deny that, that this may have been influenced by <laughs> oh, the Shaw brothers. I thought it was influenced by Warner brothers. Yeah. Which, yeah. I was going to say, which the Shaw brothers logo itself is a rip off of the Warner <laughs> brothers logo. And anyone who doesn't know that, just look at the two side by side. Uh, right, right. Um, and then, uh, which is actually interesting that, uh, uh, run, run Shaw's main competitor and, hated former employee Raymond Chow. Oh yeah. Was the one to get a co-production with Warner brothers before, before run run Shaw ever would. Right. So I wonder if that also kind of rubbed, rubbed them the wrong way. Right. There's in their bitter, bitter rivalry with each other. So, so yeah, we now have a swag shop. Uh, so we now have a swag shop for, um, KFG stuff. So we yeah. have like this logo, we have another beanie that has the other mm. uh, the silhouette kick logo, the Kung Fu Genius podcast, and you then there's like want. and then there are like two other ones, which one is his half shirt one, uh, uh-huh. or is his half face one with the yeah. KFG, and the other one is like kind of a round old school barbershop type logo with my photo in it. Yes, and we are going to make sweatpants. I like a lot. Yeah, we're going to make more designs, mm-hmm. uh, including perhaps some Dre and Dryson and Doctor Ison designs, some Mikey designs. Yeah, and maybe some ones where it's all three of us or whatever. But the I just TFG. put it out there. I just put it out there, and um, the uh, for those of you who are watching us here on YouTube, mm-hmm. uh, you can actually see the shop on the page. So you, if you just scroll down, like. The, the items are there, and these logos are on beanies, T-shirts, mugs, hoodies, sweatshirts, mm. uh, uh, like uh, mouse pads, all sorts of stuff. Nice. And we'll, we'll, we'll add more to it, but we do have a pretty slick set of joggers, sweatpants. With I this love logo those. On I love it too. the way they look. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, I, so definitely that's a great way to, to support the uh, – that's a great way to support uh, the KFG podcast. 
And uh, yeah, so we definitely appreciate that. So anyway, back to the question. Back to the question. So um, you want me yeah, to read it again? No. Uh, before I get started uh, on that, it's super important because what I'm starting to see more and more now between like uh, Bruce Lee channels or mm -hmm. Wing Chun channels that go and rant about Bruce Lee and Cheat Kendo and this guy's fucked this up and this guy da 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 da, where people are so convinced that their opinion is the only way to see something. I need to just say like. Right now, we are discussing a topic mm -hmm. which is based on speculation. Because how do you really know what actually influenced Bruce Lee's kick? Uh, Unless you can't he was know. here telling us. And he would be the only person to tell you that. Because mm -hmm. I, I just want to draw an example, okay? So uh, you, uh, when, did, when did you start training with me? Around what year? 2009, 2010? I'm going to say 2012, 13. Oh, 2012, 13. Yeah. Okay. So that was shortly after I left the Leung Tang organization. So you mm -hmm. already came to me once, like kind of post IWTA, right? Since that time, which has been now about 12, 12 years, um, I've, I've changed some things. Not, not like I've changed my Wing Chun, like in terms of doing something totally different, but like the way I teach things, the way I approach things, mm -hmm. uh, the way I execute certain techniques has changed from that time. As a matter of fact, I didn't even realize it until my student, Mike Yan, one of my old school students from the early days, yeah. came and visited uh, our summer ITC a couple of years ago. And then he said, wow, Sivu, like I totally noticed like you're, you're doing this and this and this totally differently, right? So I wanna use that as an example. There are certain things that have changed in the way I do Wing Chun from just 10 years ago. Mm. Now, if people 50 years from now would speculate on well, if you look at this video clip of Sifu Richter from 2011 versus this video clip from 2014, you're going to notice like these changes. Okay. You have been with me for those 12 years. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's just say one of the things that some people have noticed uh, that Mike Yan noticed is how much, how much lower I sit in my Wing Chun stance than I did like back in the old Leung Ting days. Right. It's maybe a little subtle, but he noticed it. All right. Oh, wow. So now that metamorphosis or that change has happened during the time you trained with me. So you would be there. So now someone asks you, why did Sifu Richter's stance change during those years? You would be unable to answer that. Because truthfully, although I can kind of, I can speculate about the influences, that was a slow progression over time. But the problem is that everyone wants to say, like for example, in the case of Bruce Lee's kick, oh, it was Jun Ri. And who's really going to say that? Probably students and descendants of Jun Ri. Uh, or people are going to say, well, Chuck Norris was the one who taught him like the spinning back kick. And who's going to say that? Chuck Norris fan. So what happens is you, th these people almost start with a narrative first. Mm -hmm. The narrative is their hero, idol, person they like or person they read about was the person who influenced Bruce Lee's kicking. Then they're going to go back. They're going to look at the photos. They're going to look at the evidence. And they're going yeah, to use it. that. See, this they're, is it. They're going to use only the things that support their claim and they're going to ignore the things that don't and they're going to pass it off as absolute truth that if you even can test them on it oh yeah we'll explain this photo of bruce with june reed doing this kick like the same way bruce lee does it okay yeah that's not the whole story and that doesn't necessarily mean because you look at a photograph mm. all right there are photo photographs of grandmaster yip man performing wing chun uh quite differently from many of his descendants uh, who, and some of his descendants who claim that they are the most traditional. Okay. Uh, they claim that they're the most authentic to Yip Man, and you can literally take a photo of Yip Man doing his chum cue form and the photo of these ultra-traditional students of Yip Man doing the chum cue form and go, uh, your stance is different, the bong position is different, posture is different, but you're the one claiming that you're the most traditional. But they will not talk about that evidence because it, de it, it disconfirms their position, Right. So that's the problem, is that sometimes I think these things are in the category of unknown and unknowable. Like, and of course this is pure, yeah, of course this is pure speculation, but imagine if you had Bruce Lee from 1973, a few months before he passed away, and you could ask him this question. His answer might actually be a lot more ambiguous than people would expect, because people like these black and white answers. No, it was June Reed. No, it was Chuck Norris. No, it was Joe Lewis. Right. Mm. And he might say, well, you know, I, I, I had experimented with high kicking when I was in Hong Kong from things that I learned from Siu Hong Sang. And, you know, then I had seen some karate guys in the States. So I started practicing this. And then Jun Ri gave me a tip on the hip extension. 
And I, I saw the way Chuck Norris threw the spinning back kick was a little bit different than the way I thought. So then I took this one thing. And then what, what you would realize is that it's not a black and white answer. It said he 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 already had some high kicking and then he kind of took a little idea from here that made it a little bit better. He improved something there mm-hmm. as pretty much any serious martial yeah, artist it does. Evolved. And, and I think sometimes you have a lot of these statements, these very black and white statements about Bruce Lee's kicks coming from one particular place, coming from people who are not really highly developed or evolved martial artists themselves. Because if you already have a base of martial arts training, as we can agree that Bruce Lee already had when he came to the States, then a lot of improvements and changes are these kind of subtle evolutions over time, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to these like sudden uh, if from one day to the next, suddenly Bruce Lee was whipping these spinning kicks that he was not even doing a day before. Okay. Um, it, it's usually some kind of like slow process, a, a, a gradual change and, and taking a little bit from this guy. Um, you know, th- there are, um, there are other people who, uh, who influence, uh, Bruce Lee's kicking very clearly that we actually have video graph- like video evidence of, and that's Louis Delgado. The, the former karate Louis champion Del from those guys, guy who actually I think believe beat Bruce uh, beat uh, Chuck Norris in competition. Okay. Um, and uh, there's video footage of Louis Delgado in Bruce Lee's backyard training with Dan Inosanto, doing a kick sequence, huh. like doing like I think a running side kick, jump spin kick, whatever, and then a jump kick at the end. And Bruce Lee liked it, and he had Dan kind of standing there reacting to it, and he just watched Louis Delgado do it in that kicking sequence in its exact order, Bruce Lee does it in Enter the Dragon. Okay? And you can see that a few years earlier, maybe five years earlier, uh, Louis Delgado is doing that same kick sequence in Bruce's backyard. Amazing. So, so was Bruce seeing those kicks for the first time in his backyard? Certainly maybe not. That sequence. Yeah, but the way they were strung together, and he was right. like, oh, cool. Because now he's looking at someone who comes from a style that does a lot of kicking and he's looking at how an expert in that style would string the very same kicks Bruce Lee potentially knows already. Mm. And he's just looking at how the guy is doing it because everyone, like a lot of people who have these arguments assume like it's a zero sum thing. Bruce Lee either knew no kicking and then suddenly learned this kicking from these aforementioned masters Mm -hmm. or the whole thing is false. It's like, why is it only one or the other? Well, why is it that, you know, it, it's because of these narratives, the, uh, the, the people who are kind of partial to Jun Ri are going to, they're going to overemphasize Jun Ri's influence oh, or, yeah. to Chuck Norris, whatever. And those are narratives, but narratives are not even necessarily an interpretation of the facts. They're just a story. Okay. And then you can use pictures and stuff easily to, to confirm this. Right. So what 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 I really want to say first before getting into this is that I don't think you can know. And I don't think that it's actually a black and white answer at all. All right. Oh. The idea that any one of those gentlemen were the first to introduce any type of kicking to Bruce Lee doesn't seem to be accurate. Uh, the fact that any of those gentlemen could have shown Bruce Lee a little tip or hack or a little inflection of the foot pivot or, or a way to do it slightly differently that he, that he took, whether they taught it to him specifically or he just watched them and saw it <laughs> because Bruce yeah. liked to observe. And I think he learned a lot by observation. I think that's probably more the case. So hmm. that's what I have to say is that it's not to, to deny the influence of any of those particular gentlemen, if it in fact exists. And I believe certainly in the case of June Reap most likely does. Chuck Norris, perhaps less so. Uh, Joe Lewis, I don't really think. I've looked at the way Joe Lewis kicked. Uh, uh, look at Joe Lewis's kicks and look at Bruce Lee's kicks and tell me Joe Lewis showed Bruce Lee anything about kicking. It's, n- it's, not, to say that it, it's uh, not to say that it didn't happen, but, but it, 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 would, it would be a hard sell, I think. To, yeah, to, no, to cr- what's crazy to me is, you know, he, he's such a great boxer. I didn't really know he, he knew how to kick that, that well. <laughs> not the same yeah. Joe Lewis, numb nuts. <laughs> What? It's this not the Lu- same Lewis. It's no, not the this same is the karate Lewis. champion, and then later kickboxer, and then later C level movie actor. So this is not Joe the, Lewis. The guy L E W I S. Oh, different. and that Joe Lewis never fought Ali either. That Joe Lu- that Joe Lewis was well retired at that time. Oh my god! Yeah, and different. that Joe Lewis did not like Muhammad Ali uh, oh. personally. He thought he was too brash, and he wasn't he wasn't well behaved 
as oh a, as a black God. man. He wasn't and well behaved. Yeah. He was too. Yeah. No. 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 Uh, uh, that Joe Lewis was so salty like uh, a, against Cassius, and then later Muhammad like, like Ali. The, like when the mafia doesn't like when someone's no, talking no, no. He just thought no. It, it, Joe Lewis comes from an older time period. Yeah. So so. It comes from a time period where the social mores were different, where there was a different expectation of black men in public, especially if you were a celebrity. Mm. And Muhammad Ali broke that mold. Mm. And Joe Lewis was from the old school that didn't think that that was right. And there was some tension between the two, at least in comments. So uh, they have some photos together. But yeah, no, but we're not talking about the, oh, not that the Joe same. Lewis, Jay. Oh, and I think that should be painfully obvious to anyone. Who knows anything about Bruce Lee and or saw this podcast <laughs> once or twice in the past. But. Not, not but least because it, this that. has been mentioned numerous times. And this I feel is, like we've had this conversation, exact conversation. Yes, or at least I've vu? watched it right. between the like two of you. Vu? It's like yeah. a deja vu all over again. It's the great Yogi Berra <laughs> one. It's deja vu said. times two. Yes. The funny thing is, is it's going to happen again. <laughs> it's sure. gonna not, happen maybe not again. now. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe not next week. But at some point. At some point in the future when AI gets so integrated and developed... People will just be able to just go, how many times did Dre not know that this Joe Lewis was that Joe Lewis? And it can like scan <laughs> yeah. eight seasons of the KFG podcast oh, and give you an it. answer in like in, in a couple seconds. Right. It's going to be great. So, um, yeah. Forward. So, no, we're talking about that. So, so, so my first hypothesis or my first idea about this is that you can't really know. And I think even if you had uh, a very late stage Bruce Lee in front of you, I think he would be able to point to certain little little jumps he made because of things that he saw mm -hmm. from different people. But, you're, but I doubt very highly Bruce Lee would say, um, Jun Ri taught me a sidekick as if he didn't know, as if he wasn't throwing sidekicks starting in Wing Chun already, albeit maybe low line sidekicks or whatever. Right. We have this in Wing Chun, right? So, so I think that even if you could talk to him, I think you, you would not get the black and white answer that everyone wants. All right. Uh, because people like things in nice, tidy sound bites and life doesn't work in tidy sound bites. So that's the first thing. So I don't think you really can know. Uh, and, um, second of all, I think that, you know, you have to be, uh, always aware when it comes to dealing with historical questions, because this is, this is a question of history. Okay. And look, this is even recent contemporary history of which some people like Chuck Norris or people who knew Bruce Lee, they're still around and you cannot get a definitive answer on this. Right. Um, mm. And even if Chuck Norris were to say, like, I was the one who taught Bruce Lee kicking, that doesn't necessarily mean Chuck Norris is lying. It's just that all these years later, if he, if he did a couple of things that Bruce Lee liked, he might not know how much experience Bruce had with kicking before and might take credit for it. Not really understanding that Bruce was maybe getting some hacks or some tips from him. Right. So yeah. the problem is like you, you even have to look at the narrators and realize that even if they're saying something that might be untrue factually, it, it doesn't mean that it's not, it doesn't mean that they're lying intentionally. It's possible. Bruce Lee was like, Hey, I, I don't really have too many kicks. Can you show me some, some, some good kicks? And, Cause I don't, I suck at kicks. Yeah. Well, it's also possible that he was doing uh, something with a Cantonese called Sa Thai kick, which is playing Tai kick? Chi. Oh. So in, in Cantonese, Sa to play, mm -hmm. Tai kick, Tai kick is Tai Chi in Cantonese. It means to bullshit someone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so the term to play Tai Chi colloquially, yeah. at least in Hong Kong means to bullshit someone. Oh, I love it. Uh, it means, it, mean, it means to give them, it means to give someone the runaround mm -hmm. to be somewhat indirect, um, but, you know, maybe like in this kind of flattering way, which is a very typical Chinese trait. Okay. Like, oh, you're so good at kicking. Like, oh, maybe you can, you know, show me something or whatever. And what, what is Bruce doing? Two things. One, he's maybe perhaps trying to find out uh, what does Chuck know. Yeah. All right. And then he's also trying to find something to improve his own game. Because uh, there's one thing that's painfully evident as someone who's taught martial arts for 20 plus years in, in New York City. Yeah. When visitors come to my school, they love talking about themselves. Okay. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and who they learn from and what they can do and how great they are. And I shut up and listen because okay. before the guy comes, all the, some, you know, random person comes to my school and sits down and great. Nice to meet you. And then like, yeah, I learned from C. Hing so-and-so in books to who to Germany and all these guys. So great. And the guy's like a no name guy or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, meanwhile, he's at my school, presumably to learn from me, maybe find out something about me if he doesn't already know. So I'm like, okay. And I just stay quiet. And this guy tells me everything willingly about what they know, what they've done, what they think Wing Chun is, what his idea is, what he thinks a good Sifu is or whatever. And then I've learned something and he's learned nothing about me. And this is a, this is a, 
you know, we have two ears and one mouth. So you should listen twice as much as you talk. All right. Yeah. I don't need to talk except on the podcast. Right. I know what I know. I know uh, what I've seen. When someone comes to me and they want to just chew my ear off about how great their perhaps no name instructor is, or even their famous instructor is, it's an educational moment for me. I can yeah. find out something about someone I didn't know. And even if Sifu Lang Ting used to always say, sometimes called negative education, right? Sometimes someone tells you things and you realize that oh, this is not what I want to do. All right. Mm -hmm. We don't only have to learn positive lessons. You can also like learn by negative examples. Go like, yeah, this is, uh, this is reminding me of how I, of how I should not be when I go to someone else's school. So also, and these are just alternating. These are just, um, alternate theories. All right. I'm not saying any of these are necessarily true. Um, but also Bruce might've been very, uh, complimentary of these people so that they would show him what they got so that mm -hmm. he could then learn a couple tips, see what they know, see how they think about fighting. Cause he was very much into looking, you know, from, from, from what a lot of people have written about him kind of sizing people up, looking at what their strengths are when he would watch people fight. This is how he made Chuck and Mike stone and Joe Lewis better karate tournament practitioners because Bruce would watch these tournaments and he would see how the different fighters would move and then he would coach them based on, okay, this guy always leads this way or whatever he was. And he would watch boxing and he was super analytical about what lead they use, you know, whether they were a counter fighter, pressure fighter, whatever, and then how you would then defeat it. So everyone says that Bruce Lee was this hyper analytical guy when it came to watching boxing, karate, martial arts, watching people move. So why would he not be that way with his friends who were also great martial artists? Right. All right. Um, why would he not maybe flatter them to the point that they then later thought they were the ones who taught him, right? Uh, you know, like not, not that they're intentionally lying. I mean, the thing is that the, the idea of black and white answers to questions like this, they, they don't exist. You, yeah. you, have to, you have to entertain all sorts of, you have to look at like, what are all the possible explanations for something like this? And the idea that Bruce was maybe flattering them to get info out of them, right could also support their narratives of, well, I, you know, Bruce really wanted to know all about my kicking. The subtitle could say, Bruce wanted to know everything I knew about martial arts in case he had to fight me. Okay. <laughs> so he would know how to dismantle me, right? right? right, right. Okay. Um, but again, I'm not saying that's 100%. I'm just saying that could be something like that. Or it could be a combination of multiple things. He's friends with them. He wants to learn something from them. He wants to learn about them. He wants to improve. He mm. wants to see different things. He wants to see different perspectives. All of these things could be true without always going to the fallacy of black and white thinking. Bruce either learned from this guy or he didn't learn from this guy. Right. Why, are, why are those the only options? It doesn't make any sense. So now, you know, having said that, the, so that entire kind of preface I just put on there about like anything I'm going to say is speculation. There are a number of different theories. Okay. Let's now look a little bit into the facts that we do know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Bruce Lee met June Rhee, I think at the, at the Ed Parker Long Beach around 64. He didn't meet Chuck Norris until 68. Okay. So that's even after uh, Green Hornet. All right. And mm. I believe that would also be the time that he met Joe Lewis. So anytime you would see Bruce do a spinning kick in Green Hornet, that had nothing to do with Chuck Norris because he didn't know him then. Okay. So, so, so that's why, like, like how, how do you timeline these facts? Well, I think the only serious, um, I'm not going to say allegation, but the, the only serious statement that, Br that Chuck Norris taught Bruce Lee anything about kicking was a, the spinning back kick. Mm, but okay. I believe Bruce Lee had already used those in the Green Hornet, which would predate him even meeting Chuck Norris. So we could then say, well, Chuck certainly didn't teach him a spinning back kick. But is it possible that Chuck maybe gave him a slightly better way to do it because he came from a style tank pseudo where they do that kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe like a timing of how you turn your head and preposition your foot to set up and chamber the leg. Right. right? Uh, there are different schools of thoughts in the spinning back kick. There's a great video uh, um, with um, um, Ro Jogan, uh, sorry, Joe Rogan uh, <laughs> teaching because Joe Rogan was a Taekwondo Ro black Shogun. belt and he has, an, he has amazing kicks. Okay. Very powerful kicks, spinning back kick. Really, I mean, Joe Rogan's got like a very legit. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's a legit martial artist, too. but he has like a very legit spinning back kick. And there's an old video where he's teaching GSP how to do it. And there are some people that when they do the spinning back kick, they chamber the leg almost like a side kick, so it's almost like a spinning side kick. Hmm. And they chamber the knee higher and off to the side. 
but uh, I believe Joe Rogan was teaching him to keep the knee up almost like when you turn, your knee is up almost like you're doing a front kick and then just like using your glutes to just extend that thing all the way through, right? And so even within the world of throwing a spinning back kick, all right, there are differences, right? Karate guy from a certain karate style might show you another way. Another karate style might show you another way. Tang Sudo guy might show you another way. Taekwondo guy might show you another way. Uh, kickboxer might show you another way, okay. right? So, so that's what I'm thinking. Like Bruce may have known a version of many of these kicks, but then he got a little hack from Chuck. He got a little hack from this guy or whatever. But this idea that they were there teaching him like he was a white belt, learning how to lift his leg for the first time, I think is kind of the, it's the implication, even if it's not stated directly. And I, I think nothing, nothing like that could Bruce actually Lee be. Bruce Lee was always kicking ass. Yes. All yeah. right. So now the idea of Chuck teaching Bruce a spinning back kick, I think is a goose egg. That, that, that doesn't make sense. He was doing them before he even met him. And he met Chuck Norris very late. Same with Joe Lewis. So I think their influence on Brucey's kicking can probably is probably not as high as some people think. Could be a hack or two. I think Luis Delgado very clearly influenced Brucey's kicking because he straight up just took a sequence that Luis Delgado did and put and put it in Enter the Dragon in the scene where they're having the big melee once all the the guards are out and everyone's yeah. fighting out in the courtyard. There's like a wow, and he jumps, and then the last one is this jump kick. That is, you can find that. Louis Delgado, Bruce Lee footage, you will see the same kick combination. It's the same thing. Super. Um, so, I so, see this. so you can actually make a much stronger argument that Louis Delgado Lewis. influenced Bruce Lee's kicking or taught him kicking because we actually have it on video and then we have the same thing showing up in the movie. All right. And by the way, Louis Delgado, who I believe had beaten Chuck Norris in competition, uh, also said that he sparred with Bruce Lee and he said he could do nothing and he found Bruce's footwork and movement baffling. And at that time, Luis Delgado uh, was like top of the food chain competitor. And Bruce still respected that guy enough to learn kicking from him. Although he could actually, and these are Luis Delgado's words, easily beat him in a fight. So this idea that like, oh, you know, oh, I beat this guy doesn't mean I can't learn anything from him. Or if the guy is showing me that's because he beat me in a fight that no one saw. Hmm. I mean, people still have these like very adolescent narratives about what martial artists do when they get together and they mm. just all need to grow up a little bit about that kind of stuff. Damn. Because, because someone is teaching you doesn't mean that they have, they're teaching you because they've thrashed you. All right. Uh, and, and it, the teaching and exchange of information can be done without any kind of ego bullshit, yeah. you know, but this is really hard for people to understand who don't really do martial arts in, in, and train it, in my opinion, realistically and thoroughly because they still look at everything in a very whose dad can beat up whose dad kind of way. Right. And it's fucking tiresome. Right. If, if the martial artist a could beat up martial artist B, mm. how does that make you any better? I mean, who gives a shit? This doesn't, this doesn't help you one bit. Right. So, um, so anyway, Jun Ri having met Bruce Lee in 64, according to some things that were written, he showed Bruce, how to do, I believe, the lead leg sidekick perhaps slightly more efficiently, which makes sense because that's like a very Taekwondo thing. And Bruce showed Jun Ri a non-telegraphic punch, right? The straight lead or something like that. But see, it's not that Bruce didn't have a sidekick. There are pictures of Bruce Lee doing sidekicks before 1964, Yeah. okay? Um, but Jun Ri may have taught Bruce how to do it from the, the more JKD frame that he would later use Whereas the sidekicks Bruce used earlier would have come from a more rear leg weighted Wing Chun frame. Mm -hmm. So then when you're now going to a Taekwondo guy who tends to bounce a little bit more in a 50, 50 stance that, that changes the way the lead leg sidekick is executed, how you pivot the leg, how you shift the weight. And that could be something that Bruce got from Jun Ri, which is like a hack to use a kick. He already knows in a different type of stance. Mm. Okay. But Bruce Lee being taught a sidekick for the first time by Jun Ri? No, there are photos of Bruce Lee doing sidekicks before 1964. There it is. So, people. so, so, so that that's why there I think it. I think it's really just about learning some hacks and things like that. Uh, the other thing that I can say is I think that there's someone, and I've talked about uh, this gentleman before on the podcast, but he tends to get overshadowed by someone who I think was far less influential in Bruce Lee's martial arts um and that's Xu hon sang Xu hon sang was a um Siu was a was a mo was a movie actor okay okay and uh but he was also a practitioner of 
uh, traditional Chinese martial arts. And he learned at the Jing Wu Academy or Jing Mo Academy in Hong Kong. <laughs> and the Jing Wu Academy, by the way, is the same academy that the movie Fist of Fury is based off of. Mm-hmm. But uh, the movie Fist of Fury is based off the original Jing Wu Academy, which would have been in Shanghai in like the, in the, the 20th century in the teens or the early 20s. And they opened up satellite branches throughout Asia and Hong Kong had a Jingwu Academy and Sion Sang was a product like Seki and Han from Enter the Dragon. Yeah. They, were, they were products of the Hong Kong branch of the Jingwu Academy, which would mean that they would learn a standard set, a standard set of like 10 Kung Fu forms, kind of generic, Tam Toy, Springy Leg, stuff like that. And then they would often specialize in a proper style of martial arts, usually either Eagle Claw or um, Northern Praying Mantis. Okay. Um, and Siu Han San was from that, that school. Jing. And he uh, was an actor. He did some of those kind of old black and white Wong Fei Hong serials. And he knew uh, Bruce Lee's father, Lei Hoi Chun. So he was, he was an avuncular character in Bruce Lee's life. I mean, he probably called him uncle, but also like they were kind of close because of the relationship between Ooh. him and his father. And uh, according to Hawkins Chan, uh, uh, oh, the, the yeah. late Hawkins Chan, Bruce Lee's friend, um, Hawkins kind of uh, made fun of Bruce Lee a little bit when Bruce said he was going to go to the States and teach Kung Fu because Hawkins said, well, I mean, you only know the first two forms of Wing Chun, but <laughs> what are you going to do when you teach the, uh, the Chum Q to your students in America? And then, you know, what else do you have left to teach them? Yeah. Right. And then uh, the idea was like, well, maybe I should learn a few more things to teach them. And rather than, you know, going to Yip Man to learn more, because in Wing Chun, you can't learn Buji or Dummy until you're qualified. It's not just like saying like, hey, can I just do the wooden dummy form today? Well, if you don't have the basics. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In the traditional like, Wing Chun school, no. He was going to leave I mean, soon. there's a lot of self-taught people on, who teach themselves from YouTube University. Oh, yeah. He could have learned who, from who, YouTube back who, then, too. Who don't realize that um, Wing Chun form, Wing Chun is a system, so you learn things in an order, step by step, and then you learn how to apply these things, and then one thing builds on the next. Mm-hmm. Whereas some other Kung Fu styles... Um, the order you learn the forms are not that important because the forms are all coming from different styles of martial arts. When you look at a a lot of the forms that are in Northern Mantis, um, a lot of the forms aren't even Mantis forms. They have like generic Kung Fu forms in there. And if those were taught out of order, it wouldn't really matter because they're all forms with a lot of choreography. (laughs) Their most basic form is still a lot more complicated than any form in Wing Chun. So even in Hong Kun, uh, even in the Lam Jo system of Hong Kun, it's not even a completely agreed upon which the first form is. Mm. Because you have some people, they teach, um, uh, I think, Mui Fa Kun. Some other people teach Lao Ga Kun within the same family. Can you imagine in Yip Man Wing Chun if there was controversy as to what the first form was? Be like, yeah, everyone knows it's Siu Nam Tao, right? <laughs> but, the, but that is not a given in other styles. And sometimes, and you know, probably a lot of our watchers who only know Wing Chun or maybe just do Ji right. Kundo know a little bit about Wing Chun. Um, do this kind of historian's fallacy, which is assumed that every other style is is taught like step by step, or or the form order is exactly the same like it is in Wing Chun. And uh, the truth is that many of these styles that have catalogs of forms, like Choi Le Fat, Ungar, uh, for example, don't necessarily have a standardized order that you would learn it in. That's, so Bruce was wow. able to go to Uncle Siu and, and learn a, and learn forms. a bunch of forms. Yeah, and he did this very quickly before coming to the states. And when you see Bruce Lee in the screen test, like uh-huh. the, the famous Charlie Chan screen test in 65 or late 64, um, when he goes like, this is a crane form, right? Start off, right? And then he does the whole thing, right? You um, don't sound like him at all. That is what he learned from Siu Hon San. Yeah. Th- those are like, th- those are, and, and whenever Bruce would do a demonstration and go like, this is what the other Kung Fu styles do, that was like his... That was like his set list. He would do that same exact beat. Mm -hmm. And then he had another one, which was like a jump spinning kick. Um, He would do like a few forms and then he would do the kick up. He would put it, he would kick up and put his foot behind his knee, drop down and jump into a kick. And that's what he did in enter the dragon before Bob wall walks in. Do you remember he's practicing in his room and, and they have the, the shot from above and he jumps and he does a kick and then he holds his leg. Uh, That's old stuff he learned from Siu Hon San. Okay. Like the jump and all those kind of kicks. So the idea that Bruce had to come to the U.S. to learn what a jump kick was is not even historically accurate, okay? <laughs> because he was already doing that stuff and he would use it normally at demonstrations and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, I think it's very, very difficult to make a 
fact-based claim that any of those gentlemen really taught him kicking uh, because he clearly had it before. And I think Suhon Sang is, is much more of an influence on Bruce than, yeah. than Fuk Young was. Uh, if you look at the old contemporary writings about Fuk Young during that time, uh, there's nothing to indicate that he wasn't anything more than an avuncular character who maybe showed Bruce some kind of operatic moves or whatever, but there was no claim of him knowing Red Boat Wing Chun by the back first then. time he did uh, martial arts or shown martial arts on film was the uh, that movie, the Charlie Chan screen test. Was it that? Or no, because that what? would have been sixty five, and okay. then there's the footage of him at the sixty four Long Beach Karate International Tournament. Okay, where, well, where he's demonstrating like, with a uh, tacky motion Kimura. picture in a film. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I mean, I think the, the first time he did it on screen, like for mass audiences, would be the Green Hornet. Okay. Now, that's remember, what I'm he was a childhood actor, and there were a couple movies he made, especially towards the end of his time in Hong Kong when yeah. he was like a slightly older teen, where he played like a punky the teenager. Orphan. Yeah, but uh, those were like the fight scenes in there were just like street fighting, just like wailing on someone or something okay. like that. It wasn't any martial arts stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, although if you actually watch some, like the couple of his Mikey, final have you movies. Seen the Orphan? We should all watch it. <laughs> if you watch some of those last movies uh, that he made, like shortly before he left Hong Kong, and I believe it was either the, uh, probably the Orphan, but could be another one that was in color. Uh, Bruce is dancing the cha-cha okay. with one of, one of the characters in there. And if you look at Bruce's hands, you see his bottom three knuckles are red from his Wing Chun training. Oh, so you see like from hitting the wall yeah. back, right? So you see while he's dancing. And he's a teenager in this And movie? he's a teenager, but uh -huh. it's shortly before he left because Bruce really didn't learn Wing Chun until shortly before he went. So he didn't really learn Wing Chun for a long period of time. I know that ups upsets some people because like, no, he was learning since he was 13. <laughs> uh, right. uh, his mom said so, all right? I mean, ask my mom when I started learning Wing Chun. Oh, she, yeah. she would not know. Seven. All right? He, <laughs> she's always been doing martial arts his whole life, but she doesn't know exactly what right, it right, is right. or whatever. And also... There's this kind of like, it, it's, it's like the, um, uh, what do they call it? The, um, what is that effect where everyone has kind of a mass delusion? The Mandela, Mandela effect. effect, right? Um, oh, Bruce, yeah. Bruce may have said it a few times that he started at 13 because he may not have remembered. Uh, and then everyone else just started saying that because Bruce Lee said it. And then suddenly Bruce Lee started at 13. But if you look at the timelines, very clear. He didn't start learning Wing Chun until he went to St. Francis Xavier, which meant that it had to be after he got kicked out of LaSalle. So it couldn't have been when he was 13. So, uh, so it's also possible that Bruce himself misremembered that yeah. as well. Um, we, are not, we are not always the most accurate narrators of our own experience as well. So um, I think that that answers that question to the best of my abilities. All right. So what else we got? So what if you could transport back in time for a front row seat into the life and legacy of one of the most respected Wing Chun masters in history? Gong Sao Wong, a tribute, direct students on Sifu Wong Sao Leung offers you just that. Through a series of exclusive conversations, 25 direct students share anecdotes, reflections, and personal stories offering in-depth understanding of the man behind the legend. Order your copy today across 12 Amazon marketplaces with free shipping. I absolutely love this book, and I think you'll find it an indispensable part of your collection. I can't recommend it enough get yours today go to amazon type in gong sao wong and there you go wow good stuff i know i was there okay I, what are you impervious to the mandela effect i he is I the, am the he mandela is the mandela effect. effect i think he is the i own you, it you either are the Probably. mandela oh you're because yeah. you know because it's like you can't remember anything I, yeah i created yeah. this shit you're right yeah, I think yeah so. Sinbad was in a movie called Kazam. You know that, right? Of course. Yeah. You've seen it, right? Shazam. Is it Shazam or Kazam? It's Shazam. It's Shazam. Oh, Shazam. And yeah, you've seen it, right? Fuck, fuck. I think he has it on VHS at home. Hell it's yeah. on his shelf. Hell yeah. 100%. Hell yeah. We should watch that with Hard Boiled. <laughs> with Hard Boiled. Yeah. yeah. Is that a movie about eggs? All right. What you got for me, Dre? I got Roberto Santiago. All right. Another Patreon. You know, he who was, actually just recently yeah. came and visited our winter ITC. That's right. Yeah, That's he's right. down there in he Florida. Represented. Yeah. Awesome. He did a great job, too. All right. So question for the Kung Fu Genius podcast. Afternoon, Sifu Alex. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We, uh, it's still morning, but for us. It's still, uh, it's still uh, not noon yet at the yeah, time right, of this right. recording. <laughs> In John Little's book, Wrath of the Dragon, The Real Fights of Bruce Lee, page 112, uh, room 112, where the players dwell, there is a section More like where... like room 237. 
Hey, yo, I think I remember 237. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Oh, the, oh, someone in there waiting for you, Dre. Oh, no, nah, we don't need yeah, that. Yeah, it's your future, future ex-wife that. waiting, no, in, the, waiting, waiting in room 237 There is a section where Yip Man engages the now famous Bruce Lee in Chi Sao and is apparently frustrated and angered by Lee's performance. Hmm. It reminded me of an article in the February 2016 edition of Wing Chun Illustrated magazine entitled John Dilek. Or Jern Dilek, or however you pronounce it, Exposition of Wing Chun's Hidden Power. Page 40, that shows that classic photo of Yip Man and Bruce Lee practicing Chi Sao. Mm -hmm. In the photo, the author notes that Yip Man's head is postured up, his shoulders are set back, his elbows are on top of his hips... His hips are forward and his buttocks are tucked in. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay. Tucked in. So, so, so basically he's doing the standard Wing Chun technique, which would make sense because he is he Yip is, Man after all. Yeah, he is a uh -huh. grandmaster. You're right? making Bruce this so Lee. dramatic. I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. You're making this so dramatic. Well, I know. I, as I was, I was reading, I saw buttocks and I was like... Mm -hmm. Okay, he gets excited. Uh, yeah, his yeah, eyes yeah, scan yeah. for words like that. All right, go mm -hmm. ahead. Mm -hmm. Buttocks. Okay. Yeah, and and you can say something about Bruce's hips are kind of duck butt, they're kind of like sticking out, right? <laughs> Bruce right? Lee is the exact opposite. Yeah. yeah. Lee has his head leaned forward. Mm -hmm. His shoulders are extended out. Mm -hmm. His elbows are on top of his uh, on top of nothing. His hips are tucked back. Right. And his buttocks are stuck out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we call duck butt in Wing Chun. Yes. Could it be that Bruce Lee was not good at Chi Sao because his body positioning was all wrong against Yip Man? Or that Bruce Lee, as John Little's book cites, did not want to upstage his master? Mm. Yeah, uh, another great question, but also another one that... Uh, piles a lot of uh, assumptions on top of other assumptions. Uh, assumptions on people's intentions that are no longer around oh. assumptions on what people were thinking or not thinking. And sometimes people again, assign narratives to photos because you know, you're going to have, it, it's like this, depending on what martial art or what side of this argument you're on, whether you're a Wing Chun guy, a Jeet Kune Do guy, if you're a Wing Chun guy, you could be a traditional Wing Chun guy or a modern Wing Chun guy or, or, uh, a very classical guy or, or someone, a hybrid Wing Chun guy. If you're a Jeet Kune Do guy, you could be an OJKD guy or you could be a JKD Concepts guy or you can whatever, right? And so you have all these spectrums skewing in so many different directions, yeah. more liberal to conservative on the martial arts end to two different martial arts, namely JKD and Wing Chun, interpret in interpreting the same photo. Okay. And what always happens is whatever style, wherever you fall on the spectrum, wherever you're coming from, that's your narrative. And it's, it's unfortunate, but it's a fact mm -hmm. that, um, and I, I don't know, maybe because I've been doing this for so long. If someone tells me they're from a certain lineage, before another word comes out of their mouth, I can most likely guess pretty accurately <laughs> whether they uh, think Bruce Lee was good or think Bruce Lee sucked, uh, what they think of certain other people in the Wing Chun lineage. Because over time, through postings, online, boards, whatever, you see what all the students and descendants of all these various lineages, what their talking points are and what their sticking points are when they argue with someone else. And I've spent many, many years as a lurker reading all those things. So if someone tells me that they're from a certain lineage, I, I can probably guess with pretty... Decent accuracy, what they think of Wong Sun Leung, Leung Ting, Yip Man, Bruce Lee, this mm -hmm. other guy, this other guy, because they almost always fall in line with what their school says, just like religion, just like philosophy. All right. Uh, you, you, you know, if, if someone uh, tells you that uh, they believe in a certain thing is moral or immoral, you can often draw a straight line to probably what their background is or what their their, their, their religious background or whatever it might be, right? Because, because there's not a lot of independent thinking going on in these walled gardens of 
people's style, lineage, philosophical adherence. It, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's almost comical. All right. Someone tells me, Oh, I'm a student of so-and-so. And I'm like, okay, you probably think this and this, even within my own lineage, Lang Tang Wing Chun. Mm. If someone tells me who their teacher is, I can, I kind of know how they train, what their training program is, what their, what their thoughts on fighting, chi sao, whatever is, what they don't know from the Hong Kong. I just, cause I've just been around for so long and had so many of these people visit my school. Right. Wow. So again, um, to answer a question like this, you have to speculate on what people were thinking, what, what their intentions were, uh, whether certain stories attached to these photos are even true or they're just narratives after the fact to prop up someone's idea. And then you have to be mindful of your own bias when, yeah. when doing this, right? If, although I am from the Lang Teng system, I try my best not to look at these kind of questions from a Lang Teng narrative because that's his narrative. Okay. I would tell you exactly what Lang Ting would say about that photo. All right. More, I mean, not in the exact words, but I would tell you what the sentiment was. How would he say it? Yeah. It's because Bruce Lee did not really learn that much Wing Chun. He wasn't, he, he didn't really have all the details. Mm -hmm. He was a teenager when he learned, he only cared about fighting. So is he really going to care about his hip position, his head position, these little subtle basics about alignment and stuff like that in the traditional Wing Chun way? Or does he just give a crap about punching someone in the face? All right. And then he's just going to do it kind of any, any, any which way that he wants. Right. So the Lang Ting narrative is going to be that, you know, Bruce Lee was maybe not as refined as a Wing Chun person as other people would like to believe. All right. Um, and I'm putting that very kindly. He probably would use much harsher words. All right. But that's not necessarily my narrative, because even if it's true, I don't I don't think that that has that that's the final word or that's all that's going on in there. Right. So um, when, when we look at the photo of Bruce Lee doing Pun Sao with Yip Man, and then you see, you know, Yip Man is in the kind of more, much more classical Wing Chun position, obviously hip forward, hand positions, everything, right? And Bruce is kind of like duck butt, his feet are a little offset. He's kind of like this, kind of hunchy or whatever. Um, it's very easy to make a case that, um, you know, Bruce is still somewhat green in, in the ways of Wing Chun, right? Except that when you realize that that photo was taken in 1965. So this is five years after Bruce Lee came to the States. So that's Bruce Lee having learned as much Wing Chun as he'll ever learn in his entire life. This isn't Bruce Lee year one. All right. Okay. That's like Bruce Lee performing classical Wing Chun to the best of his abilities. Now, when he was in the States, one of the things that he changed very quickly, especially even as early as the Seattle period, was uh, rather than doing qi sao or pun sao from the kind of parallel or pigeon toed stance, that he would put one leg forward and he would basically do it from an advancing stance or a fighting stance. You, you like 50 50 weighted. Because huh. what this would allow him to do is drive off the back leg to, do, to put more forward pressure through his arms. Whereas if you're in the classical Wing Chun stance, the forward pressure has to come through a connection to the ground through your elbows with proper positioning. Mm -hmm. But if I just stand with one leg in front, well, I can just drive off my rear leg to create forward pressure. It's actually much easier. And in order for Bruce to kind of hang in, with the limited Wing Chun that he had, and again, that's my narrative, but if we had more time, I can explain to you why I think that's true. But it is, it's obviously, that, that is admittedly my bias. With the limited Wing Chun that he had, mm -hmm. how is he going to deal with someone who's bigger and stronger when he maybe doesn't understand the nuances of unloading power and, and Chun Ma and all this kind of stuff, right? So uh, stand with one leg in front. All right, then you can drive more forward pressure. And if the person drives into you, you can dig in and hold it. All right, real easy way to solve the frontal stance problem in Wing Chun, right? It's, it creates other issues, all right? I believe it, it actually uh, causes more problems than it solves oh, in the overall strategy, but that's also just my opinion. Uh, okay. There are plenty of people who learn kind of leg forward, a very aggressive front driving uh, pressure-based chi sao that, that fight well and can do it. I'm not saying that that is not a method that works or is not, or is not valid. I'm just saying that there are other ways to, to deal with the issue, right? That maybe Bruce wasn't privy to. And it's not to say better or worse. It's just to say there are also other ways to solve the issue. All right. So uh, Bruce had been teaching chi sao to his students since about 1960. Mm, and he okay. had been teaching them pretty much from the beginning to drive off the rear leg in an advancing stance. Uh, so now five years later, he's doing photos with his Sifu. 
he's not going to stand with one leg in front of the other because that's not his Sivu's method. He would be, Sivu would be like, what the hell are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. So one narrative is he's five years out of practice from doing it the traditional way. When you have one leg in front and you're driving off the rear leg, you would naturally have your pelvis tilted backwards a little bit because you're driving. You wouldn't tilt your pelvis forward and put one leg back. You would look like Poindexter, right? So, <laughs> so your butt would be a little bit out because you're no longer in an upright stance. You're pushing forward. And your shoulders would be forward and your head would be forward. So now if you've been teaching and doing that for five years, and now because of a photo, you have to go back and do this kind of classic photo, he's now standing in the frontal stance, but with some of the attributes of what he's actually teaching in the States which isn't the same. So I don't necessarily say Bruce is making That's those fundamental Wing Chun errors because he's a hack who didn't know the correct one. There are a few photos of Bruce Lee, very few, practicing Chi Sao with Yip Man, very, very small one. There are not that many, there are a few. Practicing Chi Sao with Yip Man before he came to the States. So this is like teenage Bruce, couple photos. And Bruce had hip forward. He had the very classical Wing Chun position. And there are other photos of Bruce performing Wing Chun, very few, while still in Hong Kong. And he had a very classical kind of hip forward posture upright way of doing it. All right. Yeah, he made some mistakes. He was also kind of green. But um, I don't think that those things that people are kind of making, like that very traditional or classical Wing Chun people are making fun of in that photo, like the duck butt and the offset feet or whatever. I think that was just Bruce being slightly out of practice doing Chi Sao in the traditional way but being forced to do it because of a photo shoot with a seafood. I'd, for me, that seems, that seems to be m much more what's going on. Interesting. And, and, and so the, uh, the, uh, the idea then that, um, you know, Bruce came and did some cheese out with Yip Man students, which John Little does talk about in his book. Um, that's probably very true. All right. Um, the assessments of exactly what happened like Bruce running over certain students or whatever, it's unclear exactly where we're getting that information from. I don't necessarily have reason to doubt it because um, people always look at things like, well, these are guys who learned directly from Yip Man and then Bruce was only a little student for a short time, but he was so great and then he was able to beat these guys or whatever. It's Again, it's still this kind of very black and white thinking, right? On any given day, let's say there was a senior student from my past you know, I've been teaching now for 20 something years. Let's say there was a student I haven't seen for a very, very long time, but maybe someone who did train with me for a few years early on and was very good and then moved away from New York and then came back and visited, but still kept in practice somehow. Mm. And then came to one of my random classes and did some cheese out with some of my students. Well, that old student of mine who may have changed it a little bit, hasn't, hasn't been in formal training for a long time, but did learn something from me and was pretty good might still be able to best some of my students who may be students who are themselves not that good yet. Mm. It's just that because they're currently learning from me, that doesn't mean that they're already at some high level status. All right. So what, what people always forget is, yeah, Bruce Lee came into a class of Yip Mans and trounced some students. Most likely those are students who are either not as serious. Maybe there were some senior students there. They said Wong Sun Lung was there. I, I, maybe, I don't know. All right. Um, but who knows, who was he doing teas out with? It could just, these could be people who just started a couple of years earlier and Bruce still would have been their senior anyway. All right. So the idea is like, oh, well, they were learning from Yip Man. Yip Man did not really teach the students that much directly himself, even into the early 60s. He was pretty hands off. In, in fact, if you really want to make a case, with the exception of some private students who had the chance to learn a little bit from Yip Man, the time for people to really learn hands on from Yip Man was in the 50s. When he was still young, by the 60s, he's not really, by the late 50s, he's not teaching that much himself anymore. So, so again, so you have some, some people who are learning from some sea hangs and maybe some seniors here and there, but they're not, it's not like they're there being trained. Like Yip Man is not there, like screaming out, you know, like, like, come on, like pushing them on the heavy bag and, you know, kind of Rocky montage style training. He's not Mick from Rocky. No, no, mm -hmm. they've been around for a while. No, they're, they're bums. I want you to eat thunder and crap lightning there, Mr. <laughs> Chai Shantin, right? Okay. No, it's not like that at all. Okay. Yeah. And so I think, I think that there's a lot of like projection on like all of Yip Man's students being like these like soldiers that are there ready to fight. When it's just 
a, a bunch of dudes who are kind of hanging out after yeah. work and doing some Wing Chun training yeah. for fun. Bunch and of restaurant Bruce, workers. Yeah, and Bruce was a serious martial arts guy. So he yeah. took what little he learned in Wing Chun and he really developed it. And I think there is a, a under, people underestimate um, how much teaching other people helps you in your own oh, yeah. training, especially if oh, you're doing yeah. it in an honest way, right? Yeah. Because like Bruce maybe didn't know that much, but when he starts sharing it with other people, he has to explain it. He has to improve it. He has to overcome when they have objections about how is this going to work here and there. And he has to come up with some patches, which means he has to use his own brain, which means that he develops something that is really familiar to him because it's from his experience based on his Wing Chun base. Right. Whereas other people, they uh, are so staunchly traditional that they feel that applying their own brain to what they're doing is somehow breaking with tradition and they're just waiting to be spoon fed by their instructor onto what to do next. Mm. And they don't, they don't own it. They forever rent their Kung Fu. So, you know, it's, it's like you take the guy who was the banger from five years ago and then he comes in and he trains with like your normal Wednesday crew that are just there for fun. Cause it's after work mm. and they go, Oh man, like the, the beat the shit out of all those guys. Right? Like, so I go like, all of those things may be true. And then Bruce Lee may have had, had to hold back when he was doing chi out with his nearly 70 year old Sifu who's smoking and in the early stages of cancer. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe the 20 something year olds fanatical yeah. martial artist had to go easy on his own, you know, on his starting to die old man Sifu. Ooh, shocker. All right. Love Let's put, put, put headgear on custom auto and, and put him against, uh, of Tyson in, in 86. Okay. I mean, come on. All right. Like what, what are we saying here? People like get, oh, no. get, get over it. All right. The oh, fantasy of terrible. the old aged Kung Fu master who stops everyone with his fingers. This is, not, this is not true. It never was that. And it doesn't need to be. That's not why you respect someone who's an older established instructor. Like you, you still have to be beating the shit out of people when you're 99 to prove your worth. After that time, you, you, the, your, 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 your worth as a martial arts instructor is in the students you produce, not just in what a badass you are. It's, it's not about you. It's about them. And this it's is why a lot them. of Wing Chun people who teach, they fail. Because it's always it's about not them. about you. It's about always the about students. Them. All right. And, and look at a lot of these Wing Chun guys online and the way they talk about it. It's just about them. All right. Mm. And, um, you know, I might have a public persona. Um, but I mean, when I teach, I'm in service to the people who come to my school. And that's the way it should be. And that's all I got to say about that. All right, peeps. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius. Hit that bell for notifications. Support us on Patreon. Check out the swag shop below. All sorts of cool t-shirts and beanies like the one I'm wearing here for you guys to check out. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a Kung Fu genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Seekung. And I produce masters. You surpassed us. Your Kung Fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt. Alex Richter, always the victor. Lights, der Leeds, word, word, der Ernstein. Ernst Sien. What did he say? Der letzte wird der erste sein. Wird der wird. erste sein. Der letzte wird der erste sein. The last will be the first. All right, it's episode one, two, three. Bam! All right, here we go. It's episode two or three or whatever the new season. <laughs> oh, dad. Okay, you ready? All right, peeps. On today's episode, episode of, of Kung, Kung Fu, Fu Genius. Genius. Look at that hat head I got there. The bro. genius has hat hair. All right, peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu you can't even say the Kung Fu genius. I'm out of here. On today's episode of the Guai Lord Shi, Guai Lord Chu. All right, all right, peeps. Why are your voice cracking? Why are you coming with the cracking? All right, peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of Patreon. What? Huh? All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering two questions from the Patreons. Lots of jokes. <laughs> you know, that would have been awesome if you just committed to the part. You know what I mean? Uh, hey, my uncle taught Taekwondo don't and taught Bruce Lee lots of kicks. Is that what you said? Hey.
Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good, Dre. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Jesus, Dre. Jesus, Dre.